Disclaimer, this is the internet. These facts are concurrently also from the internet and other random printed sources. Please take them with a grain of kosher salt, or in other words, the podcast assumes no responsibility or liability for any errors or omissions in the content of this episode. Viewer discretion is advised. And I would like to point out that I in no way mean to get go over or belittle or demean the victims in this case, the three innocent boys, especially having a boy myself. Um, and it's, it's sensitive material. I don't actually like talking about the, the brutal murder um, of young boys. So please keep that in mind. And if you're sensitive to that, uh, you might want to fast forward through that part. But I will be brief and I will be sensitive to it. Moving on. The West Memphis Three are three men convicted as teenagers of the murder of three boys in West Memphis, Arkansas. During the trial, the prosecution asserted that the juveniles killed the children and left them in a creek in a wooded area as a part of a satanic ritual. Now, in my last episode about the San Antonio Four, check that out, I delved into satanic panic specifically. Please, um, like I said, check that out and also don't forget to subscribe. Uh, the satanic panic is a moral panic consisting of over 12,000 unsubstantiated cases of satanic ritual abuse starting in the United States in the 1980s, spreading throughout many parts of the world by the late 1990s and actually persisting today. This case may be the most noted jewel in the shining crown of infamous satanic pa panic cases, if you will, in the United States. It got a lot of media. On a warm, sunny May day, three eight-year-old boys set off on a bike ride around their hometown of West Memphis, Arkansas. The next afternoon, on May 5th, 1993, the boys, Stevie Branch, Michael Moore, and Christopher Byers, were reported missing in West Memphis. The first report to police was made by Byers' adoptive father, John, Meyer, John Mark Byers, around 7 p.m., now, John Mark Byers is the super kooky one in the Paradise Lost documentary, which I highly recommend. More about him later. The boys were allegedly last seen together by three neighbors who, in affidavits, told of seeing them playing together around 6.30 p.m. in the evening, they disappeared, and seeing Terry Hobbs, Steve Branch's stepfather, calling them to come home. Hmm. News of the three missing eight-year-old boys led to a search of a mosquito-infested four-acre woods near Interstate 40, where neighborhood children would sometimes play. The search of the woods called Robin Hood Hills turned up nothing, at least that night. A more thorough police search for the children began around 8 a.m. on March 6th, um, excuse me, May 6th, led by the Crittenden County Search and Rescue Personnel. Searchers canvassed all of the West Memphis area, but focused primarily on the Robin Hood Hills, where the boys were reportedly last seen, despite a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder search of Robin Hood Hills by a human chain, searchers found no sign of the missing boys. Around 1.45 p.m., juvenile parole officer Steve Jones spotted a, a boy's black shoe floating in a muddy creek that led to a major drainage canal in Robin Hood Hills. A subsequent, a subsequent search of the ditch revealed the bodies of three boys. They had been stripped naked and were hogtied with their own shoelaces, their right ankles tied to their right wrists behind their backs, the same with their left arms and legs. Their clothing was found in the creek, some of it twisted around sticks that had been thrust into the muddy ditch bed. The clothing was mostly turned inside out. Two pairs of the boys' underwear were never recovered. Christopher Byers had lacerations to various parts of his body and mutilation of his genitals. It's especially hard to read this shit to you when you have kids, like I said. Moving on. The autopsies by forensic pathologist Frank J. Peretti indicated that Byers died of multiple injuries, while Morin Branch died of multiple injuries with drowning. Upon hearing the news, Terry Hobbs, stepfather of Stevie Branch, reportedly fell to the ground and wept. Mm -hmm. Police initially suspected the boys had been raped. However, later expert testimony disputed this finding. 
Trace amounts of sperm DNA were found on a pair of pants recovered from the scene. Prosecution experts claim Byers' wounds were the result of a knife attack and that he had been purposely castrated by the murderer. Defense experts claim the injuries were most likely the result of post-mortem animal predation. Police believed the boys were assaulted and killed at the location where they were found. Critics argued the, that the assault, at least, was unlikely to have occurred at the creek. All three boys were second graders at Weaver Elementary School. Each had achieved the rank of wolf in the local Cub Scout, Cub Spat, wow, Cub Scout pack, and they were all three best friends. Moore enjoyed wearing his scout uniform even when he was not at meetings. In the film Paradise Lost, his mother, Dana, wears part of his scout uniform in a heart-wrenching moment of grief with a little delirium. Earlier in the investigation, the West Memphis Police Department briefly regarded two West Memphis teenagers as suspects. Chris Morgan and Brian Holland, both with drug offense histories, had abruptly departed for Oceanside, California, four days after the bodies were discovered. Morgan was presumed to be at least casually familiar with all three murdered boys, having previously driven an ice cream truck route in their neighborhood. Arrested in Oceanside on May 17, 1993, Morgan and Holland both took polygraph exams administered by California police. Examiners reported that both men's charts indicated deception when they denied invol involvement in these murders. During subsequent questioning, Morgan claimed a long history of drug and alcohol use, along with blackouts and memory lapses. He claimed that he might have killed the victims, but quickly recanted this part of the statement. Meanwhile, police officers James Sudbury and Steve Jones felt that the crime had cult overtones and that Damien Eccles might be a suspect because he had an interest in the occult. And Jones felt Eccles was, quote unquote, capable of murdering children. He allegedly said, it looks like Damien Eccles finally killed someone. Eccles, who had also been under the watchful eye of another juvenile officer, Jerry Driver, for some time, was a 17-year-old dropout with a history of psychiatric problems, including major depression. Eccles wrote dark poems, dressed mostly in black, wore long hair, had a tattoo on his upper arm, and was a self-described Wiccan. The police interviewed Eccles on May 7th, two days after the bodies were discovered. On May 9th, during a formal interview by Detective Brian Ridge, Eccles mentioned that one of the victims had wounds to the genitals. Law enforcement viewed this knowledge as incriminating. After a month had passed with little progress in this case, police continued to focus their investigation upon Eccles, interrogating him more frequently than any other person. Nonetheless, they claimed he was not regarded as a direct suspect, but a source of information. Investigations might have stalled were it not for the work of a local waitress named Vicki Hutchison. Hutchison told the police she suspected that killings were cult related and that she was willing to quote unquote play detective. She believed that her connection with a 17 year old neighbor, Jesse Miss Kelly, who sometimes babysat her children and mowed her yard, might provide an opportunity for her to explore the secret life of Damien Eccles. Hutchinson told authorities that Miss Kelly, who had an IQ substantially below the normal range of intelligence, told her about Eccles, his friend who quote unquote, drank blood and stuff. With the blessing of the West Memphis Police Department, Hutchinson asked Miss Kelly to arrange an introduction to Damien, who she said she would like to go out with. Jesse agreed and shortly thereafter brought Damien over to Hutchinson's house and made introductions. What exactly happened between Hutchinson and Eccles became clear only years later, but for the benefit of local law enforcement authorities, Vicki hatched quite a tale. She told investigators that on the night of May 19th, she and Jesse were driven by Damien in a red Ford Escort. Odd, given that Eccles had no car and was never once known to have driven one. To an S-spot, or a gathering of witches, in a field outside of a town where she encountered 10 young people, each with faces and arms painted black, stripping off their clothes and quote unquote, touching each other. She claimed those participating in the orgy used nicknames like Spider, Snake, and Lucifer. 
Offended by the naked activity, Hutchison, according to her story, asked Damien to drive her back home, which he did, leaving Jesse at the orgy. In late May, Vicki Hutchinson and her eight-year-old son, Aaron, met with detectives. While Vicki shared her story about the S-spot, Aaron told authorities that he and the three murdered boys often visited Robin Hood Woods together. And then on one visit to the woods, they saw five men sitting in a circle chanting and doing, quote unquote, what men and ladies do. On or about June 1st, 1993, Hutchinson agreed to police suggestions to place hidden microphones in her home during an encounter with Eccles. Miss Kelly agreed to introduce Hutchinson to Eccles. During their conversation, Hutchinson reported that Eccles made no incriminating statements. Police said that the recording was inaudible, but Hutchinson claimed the recording was audible. On June 2nd, 1993, Hutchinson told police that about two weeks after the murders were committed, she, Eccles, and Miss Kelly attended a Wiccan meeting, and she, she said now that it was in Turrell, Arkansas. She had also claimed at some point that Eccles had bragged about the murders. Miss Kelly was first questioned on June 3rd, 1993, a day after Hutchinson's purported confession. Despite his reported IQ of 72, which I had mentioned previously, and his status as a minor, Miss Kelly was questioned alone. Miss Kelly's father gave permission for Miss Kelly to go with the police, but he did not explicitly give permission for his son to be questioned or interrogated. Miss Kelly was questioned for roughly 12 hours. Only two segments totaling 46 minutes were recorded. Wow, that's insane, right? Miss Kelly quickly recanted his confession, citing intimidation, coercion, fatigue, and veiled threats from police. Miss Kelly specifically said he was scared of the police during this confession. Though he was informed of his Miranda rights, Miss Kelly later claimed he did not fully understand them. In 1996, the Arkansas Supreme Court ruled that Miss Kelly's confession was voluntary and that he did, in fact, understand the Miranda warning and its consequences. Portions of Miss Kelly's statements to the police were leaked to the press and reported on the front page of the Memphis Commercial Appeal before any of the trials began. Later, Jesse would offer his account of his experience. Quote, I kept telling Inspector Gitchell and Detective Ridge, I didn't know who did it. I just knew of it, what my friend had told me. But they kept hollering at me. They kept saying they knew I had something to do with it because other people had told them. After I told him what the five boys were wearing, excuse me, the three boys were wearing, Gary Gitchell told me, was any of them tied up? That's when I went along with him. I repeated what he told me. I said, yeah, they were tied up. He asked, what was they tied up with? I told him a rope. He got mad. He told me, God damn it, Jesse, don't mess with me. He said, no, they was tied up with shoestrings. I had to go through the story again until I got it right. They hollered at me until I got it right. So whatever he was telling me, I started telling him back. But I figured something was wrong because if I had killed him, I'd have known how I'd done it. Unquote. Phew, Arkansas. Shortly after Miss Kelly's first confession, police arrested Eccles and his close friend, Jason Baldwin. Jason Baldwin also had evil inked across his left knuckles. Baldwin and Eccles had previously been arrested for vandalism and shoplifting. However, Baldwin earned high grades and demonstrated a talent for drawing and sketching. He was encouraged by one of his teachers to study graphic design in college. Eccles and Baldwin were close friends and bonded over their similar tastes in music and fashion, fashion, fiction, and over their shared distaste for the prevailing cultural climate of West Memphis, situated in the Bible Belt. Baldwin and Eccles were acquainted with Miss Kelly from school, but were not close friends with him. Like Eccles, Baldwin denied any involvement in the killings, but detectives on the case thought otherwise. Eight months after his original confession, on February 17th, 1994, Miss Kelly made another statement to police. His lawyer, Dan Stidham, remained in the room and continually advised Miss Kelly not to say anything. Miss Kelly ignored this advice and went on to detail how the boys were abused and murdered. At a press conference in the morning to announce the arrest, Gary Gitchell is asked how confident he felt about this case on a one to 10 scale. And he said, 
11. Working to strengthen their case to something beyond 11 on the 10 point scale, police decide to re-interview Vicki Hutchinson's eight year old son, Aaron. Aaron now tells the detective that he actually had been with the three boys in the woods and witnessed their murders committed by Satanists who spoke Spanish. According to his account, he received a call the night before the murders from Jesse Miss Kelly, inviting him to bring his three friends to the woods the next day where they would do, do something, quote unquote. Once there, Aaron said Jesse, Jason, and Damien slapped his friends. This is a quote from him. I ran and Jesse caught me, then I got away and he caught me again and he tied me up. I um, stayed there for about 40 seconds and got untied, unquote. Asked by Gitchell how he was tied up, Aaron replied, quote, with a rope, unquote. Aaron said, quote, they couldn't hurt me because I kicked every one of them with a foot, unquote. Meanwhile, he said his friends got stabbed and had their clothes pulled off. Then he said they cut off the private spot, quote unquote. From a distance, Aaron told Gitchell he watched as the three teens raped Michael, Chris, and Steve. While Aaron's story would strike most people as wildly implausible, Gil Gitchell was pleased. He now had a second eyewitness to the Robin Hills murders. On August 4th, 1993, Judge David Burnett presided at a prenatal hearing in, excuse me, a pretrial hearing in Marion, Arkansas. No, I'm not pregnant. I do have babies on the brain. I'm, anyway. Burnett ruled that Miss Kelly should be tried separately from Eccles and Baldwin. Burnett also ruled that the state could introduce Jesse's confession, despite defense arguments that it was obtained under coercive circumstances. In another important pretrial ruling, Burnett concludes that all three defendants should be tried as adults rather than juveniles. The first witnesses for the state were the mothers of each of the murdered boys. That has to be really, really tough. Each described the last time they saw their son on May 5th of the previous year. Despite the suspicions of defense attorney Stidham that the husband, John Mark Byers, of Melissa Byers, might have been involved in the killings, he resisted the temptation to pursue that theory in cross-examination, fearing that to do so might only anger jurors who naturally sympathized with the parents. Suspicion about John Mark Byers' possible role in the killings continued for years after the trial, fueled in large part by filmmakers of a documentary about the case, which I mentioned. By 2012, however, almost no one believed Byers had anything to do with the murders. Now, this is the kook that I was talking about in the beginning, and he actually gifted the filmmakers with a pocket knife during the shoot, and there was blood in it. I mean, how could you not think that this knife was incriminating, right? If you were the filmmakers and this guy is straight out of a horror movie, go watch his clip seriously. And it just turns out that he's just from Arkansas. So yeah, they don't think he did, had anything to do with it at this point. Most courtroom observers expected the pr prosecution to call eight-year-old Aaron Hutchinson to the stand. After all, young Aaron was, according to the state, an eyewitness to the murders and his statements led to the arrests of Jesse, Damien, and Jason. Fogelman, however, knew that Aaron's account was implausible in numerous particulars and feared what Stidham might do in return on cross-examination. He decided not to have Aaron testify and instead called only his mother, Vicki Hutchison. She described going to an ESBOT with Damien and Jesse, but after a ruling by Judge Burnett that testimony about faces painted black and an orgy might be too prejudicial, offered few details other than she saw, quote, 12 to 15 other young people at the gathering, unquote. On cross-examination, Hutchison denied that the prospect of earning $35,000 in reward money had anything to do with her detective playing. Fogelman took jurors on a disturbingly graphic journey, which I will not go there, like I mentioned. Detective Brian Ridge testified about his search in the woods for the three missing boys and the eventual discovery of the bodies. As he did so, jurors could gaze at the bicycles of the three eight-year-old boys leaning against a wall at the front of the courtroom. 
that's a strong move. Fogelman introduced the evidence into the evidence more than 30 grisly photos of the boys, white, bound, and mutilated. To Frank, uh, excuse me, Dr. Frank Peretti reported the findings of his autopsies as the jurors viewed more photos, these of bodies on the autopsy table. With virtually no physical evidence connecting Jesse to the crime, Fogelman was left to call Lisa Sakavicius of the same crime lab, excuse me, of the state crime lab, who testified that a green polyester fiber found on a Cub Scout cap of one of the boys was quote unquote microscopically similar to fibers found on a t-shirt in Damien's house and that a red rayon fiber found near the bodies was also microscopically similar to the fiber of a red bathrobe found in Jesse's home. Sakavicious admitted that the results did not imply either the t-shirt or the bathrobe was worn by the murderers at the crime scene, but that it was possible that the fibers were carried to the crime scene via a secondary transfer. On cross-examination, the crime lab's finding appeared even less, prob less probative after the Sakovicius, after Sakovicius concealed that many fibers are microscop microscopically similar to each other and that the quote unquote discovery proved nothing. In later testimony in Damien's trial, Ridge reported that during Damien's long interrogation at the police station, he had claimed all persons hold quote unquote demonic forces inside of them. He made observations about the mystical significance of water and noted that three, the number of boys killed, of course, was a sacred number in the Wicca religion. I mean, he's a teenage boy who's just ranting and they did also go through his diaries. Teenagers. Moreover, Ridge testified, Damien acknowledged reading books by Stephen King, an author famous for his horror novels. My husband also reads a lot of those. A fact Ridge thought was quote unquote strange. Further developing its theme of a cult-related motive, Fogelman called Damien's former girlfriend, girlfriend, Deanna Holcomb, to tell jurors Damien wore all black and carried knives, sometimes in his trench coat pocket. An officer who conducted a search of Damien's home testified that the search turned up 11 black t-shirts, the book Never on a Broomstick, and the skull of a dog. The defense called Damien to the stand. Was that a mistake? Possibly. Val Price asked Damien about his family history and his interests, which Damien said included skateboarding, movies, talking on the phone, and reading. He then asked Damien about his focus on the Wicca religion, which Damien explained was, quote, basically a close involvement with nature, unquote. He also said, I'm not a Satanist, quote, unquote. I don't believe in human sacrifices or anything like that. Price asked Damien to read excerpts from his personal journal, which included favorite quotes such as, Life is but a walking shadow. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. A quote from Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. Asked why he kept a dog skull in his bedroom, Damien said, quote, I just thought it was kind of cool, unquote. Asked why he had the word evil tattooed across his knuckles. Damien had a similar answer, quote, I just kind of thought it was cool, so I did that, unquote. Question about why he always wore black. Damien responded, quote, I was told that I look good in black and I'm real self-conscious uh, the way I dress, unquote. With medical examiner Dr. Frank Peretti on the stand, Brent Davis handed his witness a knife discovered in a lake behind Damien's house. Peretti agreed that wounds found on the body of Chris Byers were, quote, consistent with the serrated portion of that knife, unquote. On cross-examination, Peretti concealed, excuse me, conceded that the Byers wounds were equally consistent with another serrated knife, in particular one belonging to John Mark Byers. Chris's stepfather... Here's that infamous knife story that I mentioned popping up again. The knife wounds to Chris's general genital area, Peretti said, were anti-mortem. In other words, Chris's genitals were mutilated while he was still alive. <sighs> Peretti also told jurors that the autopsy revealed both Stevie Branch and Michael Moore received massive blows to their heads and that Michael's lungs were filled with water, indicating that when he was in the water, he was breathing. In regards to Jason, 
The crowd in the courtroom gasped in shock when prosecution witness Michael Carson, a 16-year-old who, who shared jail time with Baldwin, testified that Jason admitted to him that he, quote-unquote, dismembered the kids and sucked the blood from the genitals. Carson told jurors he came forward with the story months after his alleged conversation with Jason because he saw on television how brokenhearted the parents of the missing boys were. Carson's explosive testimony and the thin reed of a bathrobe, fi bathrobe fiber from Jason's home that was said to be microscopically similar to a fiber found near the bodies represented the entire prosecution case against Jason Baldwin. Detective Mike Allen pointed to a spot on a map of the area around the trailer park where Baldwin and Eccles lived, which by the way, they had hard lives in this trailer park if you want to research on it more. To indicate where in a lake divers found a serrated knife that the state now implied was the likely weapon of mutilation wielded by Damien on May 5th, 1993. On cross-examination, Allen was asked whether he in fact was claiming that the knife was the murder rep weapon. Quote, unquote, no, sir, Allen answered. Quote, I am not telling the jury that, unquote. Recalled to the stand for questioning about the knife, Detective Ridge acknowledged that the idea to hunt in the lake behind the Eccles trailer came not from any law enforcement officer, but from the prosecutor, John Fogelman. Besides the disputed knife, the only physical evidence allegedly connecting Eccles with the crime was a trace of blue wax found on the shirt of one of the murdered boys and a polyester fiber recovered from a Cub Scout cap that, according to Sakovicius of the State Crime Lab, was 